Hey y'all, it's Allison. Welcome back to my channel. Um, today I'm super excited. Uh, we got to interview uh, this amazing, amazing mom named Audrey. She lives in California. She is mom to Autumn. Uh, Autumn ha is 15 and she has Down syndrome and autism. And um, if you aren't already following her, please go follow her. She posts videos almost daily and they're so great. They're so informational. Um, I've learned that I get the best info on parenting my special needs daughter from um, other parents, you know, learning from what other parents do. So um, I've watched all of Audrey's videos and I just adore her. I wish I could get on a plane and fly to California and meet her in person and someday we will soon, but um, she's just awesome. So um, here is the interview with her. So enjoy. Okay, okay so me, this is Ava. This is my eight year old. And this is my mother in law, Kim. Hi. Hi. This is Ashton. Come here. Autumn, can you say hi to Ashton? Autumn, say hi. Hey, look. Say hi. say hi. Autumn, say hi. She's kind of being dramatic. <laughs> How old is she again? Uh, so Ashton will be seven in June. Oh, thank you for saying hi. Look, Autumn. <laughs> awesome. So, what grade is she in then? She is in, I guess it would be first. First so grade, okay. Yeah, so she's in um, Blue Sprig and ABA like full time. So there's like 10 other kids there. It, so is it a school specifically for autism? Yes. Okay, that's what I thought. Autumn is actually in regular public school. She's in a moderate to severe special education class, but she's always pretty much been in that same category. But we've had to kind of fight the school district to get into her into good classes. So it's a good thing you don't have to deal with that. <laughs> Can you sit up, Paul? She's like, no. <laughs> should turn this so you guys can see her better. Hi, there. everyone. Can you say hi? Say hi. Hey, say hi. She's very much a teenager. <laughs> hey, that's okay. That's good. <laughs> She's definitely matured so much in like the last three years. That's been really good. Huh. Good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love watching her do all her chores and make her bed. Oh, I know. She's, oh my God, she's so good. And I'm sure your daughter will be like this too, but like kids with Down syndrome, even autism too, they like to feel independent. They like to feel like they're making a difference. And I don't know if that's all kids or if that's just autumn, but <laughs> I know that I've heard that they like routine and they like to help. And, and that's autumn. She's like the helper in the classroom. And every day at school, she does the lunch, like passes up the snacks. And like, they're like, she's the most helpful of all of our kids. <laughs> that's awesome. My husband actually works for Disney. Um, he's worked for Disney for almost 20 years. So yeah, it's, he works in downtown Disney actually. So oh, we go all the time. Cool. So that's why we have so many vlogs of Disney because we get in free. So <laughs> you can't beat that. Been. We still haven't been, so that's all. Oh, really well, if you come out here, I'll have to get you some tickets or something because it's definitely, fun. that would be so fun. Plus the best part about having a child with a disability is you get the disability pass and you get to go to the front of the lines. And that is the best thing ever. Wow. <laughs> you gotta have some pluses, right? <laughs> um, okay, well, let's like, we can dive into the questions that I have. Okay, sure. Me. So, um, Let's see. So the first one, I guess, you know, it's the potty training, you know, what yes. has kind of what's been y'all's roadmap. I know it's an ongoing oh, challenge. Lord. But. Okay. So we started potty training autumn, probably about three and a half, four years old. And she struggled with it and struggled with it and struggled with it. And so many people were like, you know what, just give her time. Don't push it. You know, when she's ready, she's ready. So we were in and out of pull-ups underwear all the way until she was 11 years old. If you can believe it. She finally, finally, finally mastered it at 11 years old because her teacher was so diligent at school. It really depends on the staff at school because honestly, they're with her so much. You know what I mean? So she finally mastered it at 11 years old, but unfortunately she started going through puberty. So she started menstruation and that became a whole new stressful thing. <laughs> so she had to go back to diapers. So we're still in diapers full time, but only because of that. And I didn't, I don't know if I mentioned this, I mentioned this in my YouTube videos, but we did put her on birth control 
and it's a chewable birth control. And she would take it continuously so she wouldn't menstruate to make it easier for her, to make it easier for us because she didn't understand how to clean herself and all that kind of stuff. So unfortunately she gained 30 pounds. So that was not good. We were worried about other issues that might arise like type two diabetes or more thyroid issues. She doesn't have any thyroid issues, but you know, that's very common for people with Down syndrome, which I'm sure, you know, we have to get monitored every year for her blood work and all that kind of stuff. But I was worried about the weight gain and all that. So anyway, we took her off the birth control because we talked to her pediatrician and she recommended let's try it. And if she doesn't drop the weight, then we'll make a decision after that. So it's been about four months that she's been off the birth control, but we had to unfortunately go back to diapers again. <laughs> it's just like an uphill battle with this. She does go on the potty like 99% of the time, but also what's common with Down syndrome is issues with BMs. <laughs> I don't know a pretty way to say that, you know, yeah. but either they're constipated or they have the runs. There's no in between. So when she was a lot younger, she had issues, sorry she had issues with being constipated. So we had to have her on Miralax like all the time. Right. Now she's got the opposite problem. So we cannot not have her in diapers because cleaning that up is not fun. <laughs> so that's where we're at right now. And we think that the really loose stools have to do with her menstruating again. So I don't know what we're gonna do. She hasn't dropped any weight and it's been four months and we're doing so much more exercise. And it's not helping. So I don't know if we're going to put her back on the birth control. My husband and I are talking to the pediatrician about it to see what we're going to do. But that's where we're at with potty training. Yeah. <laughs> Although she does go, she always goes beyond the potty. We don't have any issues with that unless she's having like a severe meltdown. When she has severe meltdowns, she does sometimes have accidents, like piece herself because she gets so upset. But that's about it. For the most part, it's mostly just BM accidents. Yeah, that, that's good though. That's, that's yeah. promising to hear. Ashton, yeah. did you know? Look. Every time she, <laughs> she, to go she so Ashton hates like eye contact. She hates being in pictures and like eye contact and not eye contact, but she won't look at herself in the mirror. I don't know. Oh, she yeah. She look at herself in the mirror. Yes, Autumn doesn't do that either. And she never really did when she was younger either. I don't know why. Is that yeah. an autistic thing? I'm not really sure. I think I it must know. be. Hey, Autumn. Oh, she's so cute. <laughs> Okay, so um, let's see. So next, um, does Autumn have any like behaviors in public that become like lately we've noticed and we got it under control, but Ashton was kind of like doing one of her stimming things where she does the echolalia, where she like kind of yelled and she does this thing with her hand and it was disruptive. And, but we've actually taught her, it only took a couple of days and we taught her she could do it, but do it quietly and she started. But I just wanted to see if you had any, um, you know, tips or tricks for when you're in public if there's any it, tantrums. it really depends on the store we have noticed that certain stores she's very triggered like we don't know if it's the lighting or the sound or she's just not used to it like she does perfectly fine at walmart she does perfectly fine at target she does great at kohl's it, certain stores she just doesn't like like there's a store near us called grocery outlet she hates that store there's also another store called a smart and final she hates that store so certain stores we know that she's gonna like flip out because we know her so well now, <laughs> but it's mostly full-blown like tantrum or starting, like a starting of a tantrum that goes into a meltdown. And we are, we don't always know what's triggering it. We've tried so hard to understand what triggers it. And sometimes we just don't know. We know what to do. We usually will leave the store or we'll, you know, make, have her make choices. Like what she wants to do. She wants to sit in the car. She wants to, you know, you know, calm down, whatever. Or, you know, we offer her, um, her iPad or she, actually she doesn't really like her iPad in public, but it's, it's hard. Some of the times we, most of the time we just have to leave the store. If she's having a really hard time. She used to do when she was a lot younger, like around your daughter's age, seven years old, six around there. She used to do this like screaming thing in public and these really loud noises and stuff like that. But we got her to like redirected her to stop doing that. And then eventually she understood she couldn't do that in public because it's very rude, you know, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, I mean, we still have issues also in restaurants because of food being hot. She doesn't understand. Like, I don't know what it is, but she knows it's hot, but like she wants to continue eating it. And it's like, we can't get through to her. Like you have to wait. And so even if we hold it away from her, she'll want it in front of her. So she'll fre freak out either way. But if it's hot, she wants it to be cold and she'll immediately start pulling it apart and trying to eat it. And we're like, no, it's hot. Yeah. <laughs> so that's another oh. issue we have with, with that. I've seen that video. Yeah. And, and I don't know what it is. She just cannot 
get it. Like, okay, you have to wait. And we've done waiting programs during ABA. We've done so many things to try to get her to understand it. She just does not get it. And I don't know if she's just frustrated. <laughs> she might just be frustrated, you know? Does it hurt? Like, does it hurt her mouth when she, like, does she feel the pain from it being hot? See, that's another thing too. I don't really know. We don't know. I mean, <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> And it's just like people say, does she respond the same with spicy things? And she doesn't. I don't know if she tastes things the same way we taste things because certain things like she likes spicy Cheetos and she likes like the jalapeno ones. It doesn't even bother her. She doesn't seem to care. It's weird. I don't know. Because they say um, sometimes autism like will have a, uh, the lack of pain or a higher pain tolerance. Yeah. And I think Ashton definitely has a higher pain tolerance. Yes. She does not feel pain, but um, not as much as someone else, I don't think. Yes, totally. It has to be pretty extreme because when we all got some exclusive one time, she wasn't complaining or anything. She, she did throw up and get sick and things like that. But like my boys were like, my summer is so bad. And she didn't even, it was just like, she was laying there and fine. All of a sudden she'd be throwing up, but like, we didn't know she was in pain. We didn't know she wasn't crying or anything. We're like, what the hell, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's see. What about, what does her school look like ever since, you know, like, um, did y'all, do y'all have like PPCD in California where they start at age three and then they are, she's in the public school kind of what's that looked like? Autumn started when she was three years old preschool and she actually had a really hard time. She was super hyperactive. She like, I remember so vividly the first day of school, they had like these rings that you had to hold on to and everybody had to hold on to it to walk to class. And I was like, I looked at the teacher and I was like, she's not going to be able to do that. <laughs> and by the end of the school year, she could do it to an extent, but oh my gosh, the beginning was rough. Plus when she was a lot younger, she was getting sick all the time, like sinus infections constantly. So she was always missing school and she was all over the place then. She definitely had a lot of problems with eloping <laughs> and we had a lot of hard times because, okay, in 2011, we had a house fire, we lost everything. And so we were living in my mom's house. Actually, we were living in a trailer in her driveway while they rebuilt our house. It's a long story. Oh my and God. it was so hard for Autumn being, you know, taken out of her usual routine that she was having extreme behaviors. And that's actually when we started ABA. And oh my gosh, it was so rough. It was like six months of living here, living out my mom's house and watching the house be rebuilt. So she had extreme behaviors. And that's when we actually found out she had autism. But we didn't get formally diagnosed until 2020 because, you know, you have to go to the neurologist and it's not an easy task and her pediatrician didn't want us to do it in the beginning. And then we changed pediatricians and finally they talked us, we talked her into it. It's a long story. But anyway, she, we got, we actually had to hire an advocate, I want to say three or four times mm -hmm. in the amount of time Autumn's been at school to get her what she, we think she needs, like getting her more OT, getting her into adaptive PE, getting her more speech therapy at school because the school district didn't want to pay for it because the very first IEP meeting we had with the school district, they were like, she doesn't qualify for this because her needs are too high and she's not at the level where we think she should have this. So that's when I had to hire an advocate because I was like, I don't care. She's, she was only at the time three and a half almost four years old. And they're trying to tell me she doesn't qualify for any APE. She doesn't qualify for any speech. She doesn't qualify for, and I'm like, there's no way. So the advocate got me everything I needed and more. And it, it was expensive, but it was worth it because we got everything she really, really needed. But in between that time from like first, second, third, fourth, all the way up to fifth grade was an uphill battle, finding teachers that were loving, finding teachers that cared about her, finding teachers that would put in the effort to, and also therapists, because we also had behavioral therapy starting at four years old at home, but she had all of her other therapies at school. So dealing with the teachers wasn't as hard as dealing with all the therapists at the schools, but it's, it started in fifth grade that it made a huge difference because she had a teacher that really went above and beyond and really cared about Autumn and really wanted the best for her. And I didn't feel like I was fighting with the school district. I felt like we were all on the same page, even all the therapists, they all had known me a lot by that time. And they had realized, okay, let's do everything we can to help Autumn. And it kind of, it just really shifted when she went to fifth grade. So she also matured a lot too. So it made a huge difference, but now she's at the like top high school in Orange County. So she's at the 
she's at the best high school she could possibly be at. They have a whole department, all for kids with, uh, all in special education. It's amazing with a full kitchen, um, even a playground that's at their level that all the stuff they'd want to do and swings that are for older kids. They also have like a whole area outside that's like music stuff. And it's so amazing all the stuff they have at this new school. And I'm so happy because she's going to be there, I think, until she's 21. So yeah, it's been an uphill battle. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. That sounds awesome. Sounds like you're at a good spot though, finally. That's, yes, that's finally. Cool. Since fifth grade, we've been at a good spot. So an advocate is someone that kind of professionally does this type of thing and just knows all the laws in and out. Is that what they are basically? An advocate's basically a lawyer and they re okay. they charge you like a retainer. They charge you like per hour, all the time they put into looking at her evaluations and all the things that, you know what I mean? Like for testing, they also ask for more testing and more evaluations. And that's actually how we got her AAC device. When she was like in seventh grade, maybe? I, I want to say seventh grade, I finally fought to get her an AC device. The reason we didn't do it sooner was because her teacher didn't think she was at a level to really understand how to use it. And she wasn't really interested in even playing with an iPad. She, she didn't have any interest in about, until about seventh grade. So a lot of people get their AAC devices when they're a lot younger. It's just that autumn wasn't quite mature enough yet. So we had to hire the advocate to get um, the evaluation started to get her AAC device because the school district didn't really want to do it at first. And then we got that taken care of. So, but it's, I wouldn't say we've, we've only maybe three or four times we had to hire a lawyer advocate person, but it was so worth it. It was really expensive, but it was really worth it. That's, that's good to know. That's a good, I hadn't really thought about that. I had heard of people hiring advocates, but I didn't know really kind of what they did exactly. So that's, that's good to know for later. It's really worth it because they go through all the paperwork and they really, really help you because sometimes you don't even know what to ask for. Like as a parent, I didn't even have a clue. I didn't know the wording. I didn't know what to say because there's so many things that the district will throw at you to kind of gaslight you and to kind of redirect you and confuse you. And if you're with somebody that understands the lingo, it really, really helps like a lot. I really think it's worth it. Okay, awesome. Okay, next question. What do you, where do you see, um, like, fast forward to um, Autumn being like a young adult, you know, 25 in her 20s. Uh, where do you see her, like, living? What do you see as, like, a setup for her? I really would love for her to have her own job and for her to be as independent as possible. She will be staying with my husband and I indefinitely until she can no longer stay with us. We want to, in the future, depending on our financial situation, we want to have some kind of like little house for her or a little area for her that's all hers, with their own little kitchenette and her own little thing. That would be ideal. We want her to be able to cook her own food and to do everything for herself and to have a job and have friends and even maybe have a boyfriend. I mean, we hope. We don't know. We don't know what the future holds, you know, but that's what we really want for her. We want her to have as much independence as possible. I, I don't think, okay. I don't think I could ever put her in a home only because when she was going through a really, really tough, tough, tough stage, when she was about five, six years old, I had looked at facilities and I remember walking through it and I left the facility and I told my husband, I would never, ever, ever put her in a home ever. Like I made the decision right then and there after walking through the facility, I was like, I will do whatever it takes to have her here for the rest of, you know, her life. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, that's how I learned my lesson on that one. <laughs> wow. Yeah, we, we have the same plan. So I love to yeah. say that. We, we have, we already kind of have, my mother-in-law lives like right next to us kind of attached, but still it's own separate thing. And so we hope for that to be Ashton's place. That's so yeah. awesome. Yeah. It's so awesome to have family support. My mom helps us as much as she can. My in-laws don't, they live pretty far, but my mom's always pretty much been helpful. And also my sister, my sister is going to be like, if anything ever happens to me, she would go to my sister. I have three sisters, but the ones the closest in age to me, she would take over if that was, that's like our plan. If anything happens, you know? <clears throat> yeah. And you have an older son, right? How many? Yeah. Kids? My oldest son is 16. Yeah. Autumn is 15. And my youngest son is 11. So I have three total. Okay. I see the background right there. <laughs> yeah. I've seen them in your videos. Yeah. Uh, 
how, how, like, how are they being like a sibling to special needs? Does it make them more compassionate? Are they more patient? You think? Oops, just, oh my God. Like everybody always comments about how kind and compassionate my boys are. And I honestly think it's because of having Autumn as a sister, they've had to learn to be patient be understanding, be compassionate, because, you know, it, sometimes it's not the greatest having a sibling with a special needs. It's not, I mean, it's, they miss out on things. They, they can't always go places they want to go because if she's having a tantrum or a meltdown or something's going wrong and things don't always go as planned. And that's a lot of the time they have to take a back seat to things, but there's also good things. Like, like you said, compassion, understanding, and being patient and realizing that you know, not everybody is going to be like you and you should be kind and accepting and not judgmental of me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday, Ava had some friends over and we love that Ashton's around just so, because sometimes some of her friends, she's eight, haven't ever been exposed to, you know, anyone that's different or with special needs. And especially with the Down syndrome, you can see physically where autism, you can't yeah. always see, so that makes it harder. But um, yesterday, one of the girls was just being so nice to her, just treating her just like normal. And I was like, thank you so much for being so sweet to Ash. And she was like, why wouldn't I? She's Down syndrome. Look how cute she is. And she just kept talking to her, you know, but it's not always like that, you know, but it's, it's just nice. And so it is um, nice. We definitely think Ava is much more compassionate and she's, um, you know, she really sticks up for, there's an autistic boy in her class and she, you know, she helps, she makes sure he's included all the time. So it just, we're making better humans, you know? They, they yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, okay, let's see, last question. Okay, so if you had like three game changers you could give me, cause you're like, you know, me in 10 years. So you've been through like all the steps that I'm gonna go through. Um, three like life hacks that have to do. I actually life. wrote some down because I had to really think about this. Okay. My first one would definitely be ABA because learning all the tactics we learn from ABA. I know ABA has bad reputation in some circles, but if you're using it correctly, it just like it. helpful and amazing. And I would say also like our approach, like being more patient, being more understanding and not flying off the handle when she gets upset. It's so hard to do sometimes, but it's key to compliance and to get her to, you know, fall through on a task. If you're being kind and compassionate and not, not getting angry, not, you know, what's the word, like freaking out, you know, like it's so hard to stay calm when they're being difficult, just any kid, it doesn't matter. But when they have special needs, it's even harder. I feel like you're getting so frustrated. I would be constantly getting frustrated and just our approach. I would say the next thing would be autumn's maturity has been night and day different and since about fifth grade like I said before she has completely calmed down she's been wanting to do more things she's been more motivated and that's made a huge difference a huge huge difference in our lives like she still has meltdowns and she still has moments of course but like nothing like when she was younger because it was like constantly having to worry we also got cameras because like she does still lope a little bit, nothing, nothing to like when she was younger, but we got cameras at the entrance and the exits of our house. And that helped a lot too. We used to have to have a lock on the outside of her door for her own safety because she would get out and get into things. So that made a huge difference too. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think, oh, also having caring and loving and compassionate teachers made a huge difference. And since we fought so hard to get her into classes where I felt like the teachers really cared about her, that's made all the difference in the world. And also therapists too. And I would say getting therapists that work well with you because when she started ABA at home, because all of her ABA is at home, we've had therapists in the past we've had to let go of because either they didn't get along well with Autumn or they didn't get along well with us or both. And I was always afraid to let people go. I was always afraid to talk to the supervisor. I was always afraid to stand up and say, hey, you know what? This isn't working out because they would always be like, well, this is the only person that has these hours or they would tell me whatever. And I was like, I'm sorry. I finally got to the point where I was like, I'm sorry, it's not working for us. We're not going to keep doing this therapy if she's not getting anything out of it because the therapist doesn't work well with her. So I would say that's been huge, huge, huge. Always speak your mind, trust your gut. And if you feel like something is off with the therapist, make sure that you follow through and do something about it. Because I regret definitely not saying something sooner about therapists. And have, like when she's had, 
even physical therapists. She had a physical therapist. I want to say when she was six months, seven months old, she wasn't walking yet. She was really tiny. And we really clashed when it came to character. Like we just really clashed. And I just was like, it's, you know, it's fine. I'll make it work. I'll make it work. And I regret so much not getting a new therapist sooner because I think she would have walked sooner. I think she would have crawled sooner, all those things. And I can't do anything about it now, but looking back, I'm like, why would I have stayed with somebody I didn't get along with? <laughs> so that's huge too. <laughs> yeah. Those are all great things that I wouldn't have thought of. So thank you. So yeah. Much. Well, I thank you so much yeah. for I'll let y'all get back to your Saturday. Thank you so much for taking time to talk to us. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. I can like come through yeah. the phone and hug you, and I'm gonna take you up. We're gonna come and go to Disney World for sure. As soon as I can Disneyland, get Disneyland, Disneyland, not Disney World though. Disneyland. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. As soon as I can get Ashton to wear a mask long enough to be on a plane. Um, oh, you know, she doesn't, gosh, doesn't need a mask. I know. It's well, hard to get her to wear the mask. She has to. She's actually really good with her mask, but it was not easy in the beginning. It's just like her sleep apnea mask. It's the same thing. We've had to do so. I have a video on YouTube about it, actually, that I just posted on how we did it, exactly how we did it. And that's exactly what we did to get her to wear the regular mask, too. But it's so hard when they're younger. Like, I feel for you. Because if Autumn was seven, oh, my gosh. I don't know if we could have gotten her to wear it. <laughs> no, we don't even try. I mean, we just. We yeah, it's so we hard. We haven't had to. Um, oh, I do have one more question about sleep apnea because I don't know a lot about it. Um, how did you know that Autumn needed to be looked at for sleep apnea? Like what were her symptoms? Um, it was in 2014 when she first had her sleep study done and her doctor at the times was concerned. I can't remember why she was concerned. Oh, I know why she was waking up a lot in the night and doing this weird yelling thing. And I didn't, I thought it was behavioral. I didn't think it was sleep apnea. I just thought she was bored, you know, and she wanted to get up and yell and watch the TV. So she's like, well, let's just test for sleep apnea. Let's have her do a sleep study just to be safe. So she did a, her first sleep study at Chalk Hospital and they came back that it was mild sleep apnea. They didn't want to do anything at the time. They just told me to give her melatonin and Benadryl at bedtime. So that's what we did until recently. Her new doctor, I've noticed that she's been really like tired in the morning. And I was really concerned that maybe her sleep apnea had gotten worse. So I mentioned to the neurologist actually about it. And the neurologist is like, well, you know what? Let's just order another sleep study and let's just mark it off the list and make sure that that's not what it is. So when she went back to chalk, it came back moderate sleep apnea and it had gotten much, much worse. So that's when her new pediatrician recommended we go to the pulmonologist, talk to the pulmonologist and see what they think. So the pulmonologist said, we think we should do the CPAP machine. He also offered to get her anoids removed. And I said, no, because he said that it was most likely not going to help the sleep apnea. He said it could help. And I was like, I'm not going to put my daughter through a major surgery that could help. You know what I mean? Especially because she's so difficult. And it would be so difficult for recovery and she's never been under anesthesia and it's risky and it's scary. And I didn't want to put her through that if, if it was going to kind of help, you know what I mean? So I decided it with the CPAP machine and then that's what happened. We got her fitted for the mask and then the insurance um, got the approval and they mailed it to our house and we just started using it. And I wish I could say it was, it's been easy because it hasn't been easy, but it's been really difficult. We started out just using the mask for two minutes without the machine. Then we started doing with the machine when the machine came for 10 minutes. And now she, last night for the first time, she fell asleep with it on and wore it for an hour and like 13 minutes. That's the longest she's done so far. So fingers crossed that this is the sign of the future <laughs> that she's going to do well with it. Cause once she realizes that she can sleep better with it, I know she'll want to wear it, you know? Yeah. So what does it do? Like, what does it pump into just oxygen or what okay, is it? So, um, the airway, the way he explained it, pulmonologist, he says that our airways are like this, but since people with Down syndrome have low muscle tone, their airways are more like this. And so they're not getting like the oxygen they need when they're sleeping. And basically it's making them wake up or it's making them stop breathing while they're sleeping, which is very scary. So that's why the, um, the one that she has goes over the nose and, it, and it, it's pressurized. So it pushes air into your airway to help you get more oxygen. Yeah, yeah. So, and it helps you sleep. Have you noticed the difference in it now? In her sleep, her her morning 
being a I, lawyer or anything? She's only worn it for an hour, so I can't really say, but I do feel like I do feel like it is helping. I really do. But a lot of people are saying that I need to try the full mouth, mouth one, one that covers the nose, nose and the mouth. So we have another appointment with the pulmonologist coming up and I'll have to keep you guys updated on if they decide to do the full mouth one because the, the nose one, I think makes sure your, your mouth dry. And I think that's why she keeps taking it off, but I'm not really sure because you can't tell me. So yeah, I don't know. I do think it helps, but it's, I think you have to wear it for up to four hours for it to make a difference. I mean, that's what they keep telling me. So I don't, I don't know if I noticed any difference yet, but I know that she's really, really tired and she's not sleeping good. So I can't imagine that we, even if we keep explaining to her, like, it'll help, it's gonna help you. I promise it's gonna help, you know? <laughs> we just keep hoping it's good. You know, she's gonna realize, like, she's supposed to wear glasses. It's the same thing. She's supposed to wear glasses, but she refuses. Like, she will not wear them. It's, we've tried all the methods. We can't get her to wear them. We're like, hopefully she'll understand that she, if she wears glasses, her glasses, she could see, but she will not wear them. So, yeah. It's been a little easier with the sleep mask, surprisingly, than the glasses. Okay. Well, thank you. Ash, you want to say bye? Can you say bye? Look. Autumn already left. She went to the sleep oh, mask. Oh, <laughs> look. Look, Ashton. Look. Say bye. Say bye-bye. <laughs> she bye, looks so cute. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take Very care, nice. guys. Thank you. Talk to you later. Later. Bye. Bye.